Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for today's <clears throat> seminar. Today we're joined by Addie Thompson. She's an assistant professor at Michigan State University. She's an assistant professor in the plant, soil, and microbial sciences department. She's a member of the Plant Resilience Institute at Michigan State. Addie has a, uh, has a very nice academic background in terms of her degree. She did her undergraduate studies at, at Iowa State University, her PhD at Minnesota. She did a short postdoc with Rex Bernardo, six months, is that what I recall? After she finished her PhD. And then she came to Purdue for a little while, and then she went on to Michigan State to this uh, assistant professor's role there. You know, a lot of times we're always excited about uh, seeing our students and postdocs go on to, to new activities. And Addie is, is no different. We're super excited about all the success that she's had at Michigan State. If you want to hear more about that, we'll hopefully hear a little bit about it uh, during our seminar today. But also, if you want to, uh, I think there's maybe a little bit of time on our schedule if we wanted to try to squeeze in some time on our schedule yet this afternoon and hear more about our work or learn about opportunities for collaboration. Um, her background is in quantitative genetics and phenomics. How do we integrate those two? So she came to Purdue at a time when we were really just starting to learn about how to, how to do digital agriculture, how to turn phenotypes into numbers and what does that mean from a quantitative genetics perspective. Uh, and she's really led a super successful our program at Michigan State in that space. She was recently awarded the Early Career Science Award by the North American Plant Phenotyping Network in 2023. And she's getting other awards as we go, recognizing her tremendous um, success in terms of research in that space. Um, she's developed and teaches a Frontiers in Computational and Plant Sciences a uh, project for student development. She has a real passion for student training. As a postdoc here, she was actually helping me teach some courses in agronomy and contributing to that space. And so she's really committed. We have some of our undergraduate students that are still around as, as graduate students now that were able to uh, participate in her visit. So Maddie, we're really pleased to have you here. and We're excited about hearing more about your work. Uh, thank you. I was very excited to be in invited and that was a very, very flattering introduction. Thank you. Um, so this is going to be a big talk because I have high expectations of you as an audience, because I know <laughs> that Purdue has a lot of expertise in this area. So I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a background, but I'm going to gloss over the background to focus more on sort of research projects and moving forward sort of vision. Um, we'll see how much we get through in an hour, hopefully most of it. But yes, uh, Mitch already mentioned my background somewhat um, while I was here. So I started at Purdue very pregnant. And so a lot of you knew my kids a lot in the fields um, and around the buildings. So I included them here and then you'll get the update at the end. So these photos were all taken at Purdue um, in various times while I was here. Um, this is actually in Jason's greenhouse. Uh, I, they needed a photo op of me touching some sorghum, and that was where we could find it. So that's your option. If you need a photo opportunity, go to the greenhouse. Yeah. Except that there's no sorghum there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now I am at Michigan State, as Mitch said, and uh, I do plant breeding research. I don't have to do any plant breeding per se, so I'm not expected to release varieties, which is nice. Um, but I get to do a lot of research in that space. And my focus right now is on maize, mostly, with a little bit of sorghum as well. Uh, so my lab works on genetic architecture of quantitative traits, so that's like gene and marker discovery, on improving approaches for prediction. So we utilize genetics and phenomics, um, genotype environment management interactions, and then breeding program simulation and optimization strategies. Uh, we also do a lot of germplasm characterization, so trait discovery, seeing if we can find novel um, traits, and germplasm population development. So we, I might call this pre-breeding. All right, let's remember to point this in the right direction. There we go. So what does this look like, practically speaking? Um, we do a lot of field trials. I have a little bit of gro growth chamber and greenhouse work, but most of the work that I do is in the field, because that's what's the most applicable for this type of research. And so 
we have quite a bit of nursery space that we plant as well as um, observation. There's a little drone here that you can't see very well. Um, and someone asked me the other day how many acres it was. I actually hadn't counted, but it's about 18 acres each year. So that's where we're at. Okay. Um, current projects in the lab, just to give you kind of an introduction and overview before we dig into some of the details. Um, one of our projects right now deals with the genetics and phenomics of maize nitrogen response, as well as in com combination with biostimulants. Uh, right now that's Brandon Webster, who's a PhD student in the lab. Um, I also have a postdoc who's interested in sorghum functional genomics for ecophysiological traits. What does that mean? It means she's interested in things like photosynthesis and stomata density, as well as um, characteristics like yield and plant morphology. A big focus of our lab right now is on tar spot disease resistance. And then linked in with that, we're also looking at phenolic compound accumulation. And I have a, a team working on that because it's hard to tease apart who's doing what. Uh, but a couple of PhD students, Ali and Elliot, and a master's student who will be graduating soon. And then we also have a project on sort of phenomics of canopy architecture, which I will cover a little bit later. And that works primarily with the Genomes of the Fields program, which you guys have here as well. Um, for those of you not familiar, it's kind of a large collaboration of 20 some different uh, locations where we grow subsets of the same varieties and then collect the same traits. Uh, and that is Zhongji Ji, who is also graduating and looking for postdoc opportunities, in case you're interested in taking on a postdoc. And then the breeding program simulation and optimization is Robert Schrott. Oh, and then uh, miscellaneous other things as well that I'm happy to talk about later, but I'm not going to cover today. Okay, so. Overview. I think most of you in this room are plant people, so I probably don't need this slide, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Plant is so important for me. <laughs> Excellent. I have some extra slides at the end, too, in case we need to bring that in. <laughs> um, so plant breeders generally are looking to increase <coughs> the proportion of the alleles of interest. And how they do that is they usually, phenotype or genotype, but do selections <laughs> on individuals. In this case, let's say we're breeding taller, I don't know if this is palm trees. So you're looking at the tallest individuals, make a new population overall, you'll expect it to be taller, right? But the problem is, how do you know which ones to select? So this is an example. This is actually from my plant breeding class that I brought this slide in. Um, this is from a sugar beet trial. And so if you really want to get an excellent approximation of a variety's performance, you would grow a lot of replications of that variety in a bunch of locations throughout your region of interest over many years and then directly measure your traits of interest and then make a lot of crosses. Okay. Obviously, that's going to cost a lot of time and money. So, part of my role right now at Michigan State is looking into how we can take shortcuts. What new tools can we integrate to inform this process? So, some ways we can cut corners. Instead of lots of replications, maybe we could uh, replicate genes instead of whole varieties. So if you have relationship matrices or you have uh, other pedigree information, genetic relationships, um, that's my next as well. So borrow information from relatives. If instead of maybe in lots of locations of other regions of interest over many years, maybe you could use crop growth models and that would let you make predictions across different environments and climates, which requires parameterization and lots of environmental data. Uh, instead of directly measuring things, perhaps we could statistically model them, which requires some training data and fancy math. And maybe instead of the traits of interest, we could look at correlated or related traits that are easier or cheaper, more accurate, or more predictable, more heritable, particularly. So things that are less influenced by the environment and more influenced by genetics. Um, and then for making lots of crosses, I won't talk about this today, but perhaps targeted genetic changes and gene editing technologies can help with that situation as well. So there's a few of these aspects that we work on in my lab. Um, just to kind of go over, I'm not going to go into the details of what is genetic mapping. So that's one of my assumed bits of knowledge. Um, but I'm going to talk about kind of how it's used and the limitations. So you can statistically associate genetic markers with a phenotype, right? And that's really good for questions where you want to do marker loci discovery, like in GWAS, so genome-wide association studies, or prediction, um, using the markers to estimate their effect on a trait in genomic prediction. 
Uh, it's a little bit less straightforward for basic biology, like causal gene discovery, uh, but can be useful. It's limited somewhat by the accuracy, precision, and heritability of whatever trait you're looking at. So for example, if you wanted to do genomic prediction for yield, that's not going to be super highly heritable, and you might be kind of making different choices and selections based on the year. Uh, it's also going to depend on the population that you're using. That involves what type, how much diversity is there, how much recombination do you have, what structure is present, et cetera, uh, what type of markers you have. Uh, and it doesn't consider the effects of the environment, really. So trying to make those predictions into newer unobserved environments is really challenging, if not basically impossible. So hyperbole phenotyping, where does that come in? Uh, here we can measure a lot more things, individuals, varieties, types of traits, plots, reps, locations, et cetera. It also enables new information capture. So you can measure things that you couldn't otherwise measure. The example I used to give about this was the year that we drew the Bioenergy Association panel here at Acre, and there was a big windstorm that came through and all these five meter tall plants were lying on the ground. And we were trying to climb through the sorghum and try to measure something about the plots. That's like, what, what am I even measuring here? I think I have a picture of Patrick standing next to it with a meter stick. Like, <laughs> um, but you can get that really easily from a drone. So that's great. Uh, it captures as yet undefined information within the feature space. So when you are instructing a crew to go out and measure something, you're limited by your imagination of what you can tell them to measure. Plant height or count the leaves or, you know, uh, but this can measure things that we don't even know what they are necessarily. It can be limited by the necessity to have a diverse set of skills. So you need experimental design, management, data acquisition, processing, analytics. That's a lot of different skill sets. Cost sometimes, sometimes data compute, storage, and transfer, and then varying interpretability of those complex features, right? But I think there's a lot of potential for combining these areas which is what leads me to some of my research project spotlights. Uh, I'm going to start off with some disease resistance for our TARSPOT project and then talk about nitrogen response and canopy architecture. And they'll get increasingly complex as we go. Uh, so to start off, TARSPOT. This is a disease caused by a pathogen, Phylochromatis, which is an Ascomycete fun fungi, and it's spread by wind and water. It causes these raised, shiny, and pointers black lesions that look like flecks of tar. If you scratch it and it doesn't come off, then it's probably tar spot. If it does, then it's probably bird poop or insect grass or something. I heard at one of the recent meetings, they handed out little cloths that was like a tar spot tester. And you're supposed to like moisten it and wipe it. If it came off, it wasn't tar spot. Uh, thrives in human conditions, it can spread quickly and cause yield loss. So this is a disease that's been around for the last 100 or so years in Central and South America, but it's new to the US as of 2015. So you can see there's varying spot sizes with or without these fisheye lesions of necrotic leaf tissue. Uh, it covers the leaves, which reduces the photosynthetic capacity, but it also pulls nutrients out of the stalk, which can cause it to break down the canopy very quickly and increases the lodging. So this kind of brownish area here, just a week or two later, is all lodged. And the disease has spread. This field should not be this shade of brown at the beginning of September. So this is a really heavily infested field. If only they all looked like that in subsequent years, we'd have a lot easier time to uh, score the disease. Where was that? That was in Allegan, I'm pretty sure. Allegan, uh, Michigan, so right on the lake. Um, and we did tar spot trials there for a few years, and then we also have a site in Decatur. So trying to push the moisture as high as possible. Allegan's my hometown. Is it really? Yeah. That's fun. So which one of these is Allegan? Which one's Decatur? OK, Allegan Decatur. So these, this is the spots. Um, this is part of the Great Lakes Tar Spot Initiative, of which Indiana was involved, fantastically. So we had multiple locations and chances to get disease, which was very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> um, <coughs> sense of why we chose those areas. This is recent as of a few weeks ago from the, um, the crop management group, IPM type, but they have this tar spotter sort of um, up-to-date incidence uh, map. So you can go there and look and see where has tar spot been found so far this season? Where has it been found in the past? And as you will see, it's a lot around the Great Lakes, but it has spread considerably in the last just eight years, out into Nebraska even now. 
Um, but there are spots in Florida. This is mostly in the, the winter season. They did it there. <clears throat> so I'm going to fast forward. Yeah. Is that because we're looking for it, or has it always been there? It has not always been there. No, in 2015, it was just in these few counties here. It's a new, a new disease, and it was, it was not in those other. And they were scouting all throughout here in subsequent years, and you could watch the lines of counties progress. Is this Crystal Watt? Is that a Crystal? This is the first person that I can point at. Watts. Yeah. Why is Kristen Wise? She was, so that was, she saw something and said, I think we're something, some new disease. Is that really how this all started, Christian? Uh, they contracted them before they did Indiana. I don't know. The two locations in 2015. Those samples from the last diagnostic trial. And that's where it all started. Really? But the question is, what did all people think? Yeah, that was my question. Who wanted that? So, like, the question. I don't really look for it. And I probably wouldn't see it because I'm not looking for it. Unless it looks like that. I was going to say, unless, unless it looks, it looks like, like this. Like that. Yeah, exactly. You'll see that. Yeah. Right. The one, thing that is, yeah. the one thing I find interesting is that even at the field, like here, something you see like one or two spots in the whole field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm like, where are they coming from? You know? Yeah. So, and I can say it, sometimes it can overwinter and sometimes it blows in. And you can see kind of the disease starting from the ground up, or sometimes it starts from the top down. Hmm. Within the same field again. Sorry for distracting the talk. No, that's great. Let's just get, we have a tar spot expert right here. So, <laughs> yeah, good. <clears throat> so yeah, you might not see it if it's very low. And I will say a lot of, a lot of this region, it's very, very low severity. Well, I'm looking at Indiana, and I was in one of those counties that I see as orange, yellow, or golden, goldenrod. And I wouldn't have seen it. No, it, it depends on the year. Some pathologist yeah. who is a who is actively looking for it said, "Hey, look, I think there's tar spots." Like, Where? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, because like it, there's been just a few spots some years. Mm -hmm. Some years, if it starts out a rainy season and it stays moist, the leaf moisture really drives it. And then, but the way I the way I think about this is, if it's going to overwinter, and now that it's present in all these locations, that means that we get one year that's the opposite of 2012, and the whole corn battle is de devastated, mm -hmm. right? So it's something we should probably get on top of before we have a year like that, ideally. So research projects so far, we worked on screening diverse <clears throat> temperate and tropical germplasm. Um, I've actually given a, a version of this talk that was to NAPB just about germplasm banks and the usefulness of applying diverse germplasm to these kinds of questions. Uh, we did identify some resistant, perhaps tolerant varieties. So this is a plot that was right next door to this plot. So that's pretty promising. Um, we did some genetic mapping. So we have loci that contribute to that variation and then started back crossing our elite lines, both in field corn and sweet corn. So we have some collaborations on the sweet corn side, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, started mapping QTL in an external mapping population and have been now developing and testing some new genetic populations. So we took a set of the resistant lines and started crossing them to either B73 or LH244, which is another stiff stock, but it's a little bit more modern, a lot more modern. Um, and then also I've been back crossing those to parents to study heterotic effects. So this is all the breeding stuff. If you're not a breeder, this is probably boring. That's okay. So I'm skipping over it quickly. <laughs> so this is, this is a different talk. Um, but we've also been using these populations as test beds for, for our phenomics technologies. Uh, for example, can we improve detection and prediction for management decisions? So that's where this project is now going. And I hope that you'll hear more about results of some of this work in February at NAPPN here in Purdue. So I to register for that. Addie is the Early Career Award recipient from NAPPN. She's giving a talk in Purdue at that meeting. You should register. <laughs> yes, you said that already. <laughs> but my students will also be there who will have posters. So that would be a good choice. <clears throat> All right. So our thought process is um, using some vegetative indices, if we can collect natural color and uh, multispectral data throughout the season, we can then relate that back to onset and severity of disease. So ideally, we could identify the disease before it's really abundantly visible. 
Uh, so a farmer, if they saw that, could go and spray fungicides, for example. <clears throat> We also do have hyperspectral data, but we're not good at processing it. So later I have a slide about possible collaborations. That's included on there. Okay, so currently then our next version of this initiative is that we're relating our phenolic compound accumulation to uh, tar spot resistance. And we're taking kind of an interesting tiered hyperspectral approach because we have our wet chemistry to measure 20 some different uh, phenolic compounds, but then we're interested in can we actually uh, model that so we don't have to do as much LCMS. And uh, we're using powdered tissue and leaf lever herbal spectral. Where's John Jen? Is he here? This is his leaf spec. Uh, and then drone level spectral data as well, plus LIDAR. Uh, so we're we're also planning on validating and testing some of those candidate resistance genes I mentioned, uh, and this is a collaboration I should say with Marty Chillers, Eric Gretwald, Justin Michael, and Aaron Bunchman. Okay, so any questions on tar spot before I jump over to nitrogen? There'll be a little bit more data now. All right. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So there were a few UPL reports in the story as well from work at Mm-hmm. The one that you're finding has it similar or identical? Or oh, familiar? mostly different, okay. which could be for several reasons. Um, but what I can say is that one of the challenges with using it, the question I get a lot is if this has been around in, in Mexico for 100 years, why not just use Simit's information and data? A couple of challenges is one, tropical material that isn't like Michigan, you can't grow it there. So we'd have to do some intergressing and backcrossing somewhere at a tropical location or a greenhouse to get it to actually grow, to even screen it. But the second challenge is that more recent cement material all is under what's called SMTA. So there's a standard material transfer agreement. That means that if you use any of the material, even if you cross it out a million times, there's gonna be some sort of licensing tied to that. So what we targeted here was that we used temperate material and only open source, so to speak, varieties. So anyone could take any of these varieties and use them at no, you know, there's no strings attached. Um, same thing with the tropical material we had. So um, one of the reasons that our QTLs could be different is that it is just different backgrounds. And so it's different types of resistance. But the other reason could be that we a different environment that we're seeing, you know, just different interactions. And it could be that maybe there's some of those alleles there, but there's other things that are that are at play here. One thing I didn't mention that was kind of a surprise for us, the stiff stock magic population I mentioned, um, it had, I think, five or six founders. This was out of Sean Kepler's work. And we did our, our QTL kind of validation there. We had been using B73 as a somewhat susceptible parent in our crosses. But in that magic population, it was actually one of the strongest alleles for resistance. So weirdly, our double haploid populations with that as a parent might have some resistance on both sides that are kind of complementary. I don't know yet because we haven't been able to stress those lines enough to really say a lot about them. But can't can't get them to infect. Yeah. yeah so there's no single gene control resistance, right? Like I don't think I don't. Well. Not that I would call that. Yeah. But again, until I have. It takes a lot of proof for me to be able to say. <laughs> but if you can right here or like whatever, you still see some um, stroma, right? Rarely, yeah. but it is possible. In a high pressure year, it will have a, like two or three spots. Do you have a question? I'll let you continue because my question is genetics. There's no big data right now. <laughs> Okay. I can talk to you later. I have a whole list. <coughs> but it is in the list. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm assuming it's something that has antimicrobial properties. Uh, well, that's that's the thought. That's the thought is that they might be involved in, um, in resistance. They might be involved in. Obviously, there's some of them that are like antioxidants. Mm -hmm. So yes, but I'm happy to share that list. Um, for your leaf level measurements that you want to transfer model, it's what spectrum? 
Vmir? The leaf spec is Vmir, yes. Yeah, I would love it if it was. Uh, I know, I know, I know. But the FTMIR is actually a really, really wide range. So the, oh, I didn't mention that. This powdered tissue is a, is a Brooker FTMIR that's mm -hmm. much larger. Yeah. Range. So yeah. hopefully that one. I mean, you're going way out there with that. Right, so, <laughs> so we're we're hitting it at multiple. Um, so this, yeah, this is this is Vmir here. This is the Vizmir Swear that is the co-line system from Headwall, and then this is the Brooker FTMIR. Could have listed more methods on these slides. Okay. Oh, right. Uh, nitrogen. So one of our interests, unless you have questions. Okay, one of our interests in recent years has been on nitrogen. Uh, I'm just giving you an example of. Uh, some of the drone imagery that we pulled out along with various information from these hybrids. Uh, but the big question is about uh, learning about how different varieties respond to nitrogen fertilizer or the lack thereof. Um, the reason being, as you probably well know, nitrogen fertilizer is one of the most expensive inputs next to seed um, and has a lot of price volatility. So this is from the, the Green Markets Weekly Fertilizer Price, and price Index. I pulled it out at the end of September, so I haven't updated this slide in a month or so. I apologize. But I will tell you, this project started, um, I think, here. So, so we were seeing this was getting really, really dramatic. Um, but this creates a really challenging problem for farmers, right? Because how do you know how much nitrogen you need to apply is, is a question that deals not only with how is your particular variety going to respond in your particular soil with your particular weather, but also from the economic standpoint of what's actually going to be a benefit, a net gain in, <coughs> um, in uh, income. Along with, okay, obviously there's a lot of increasing political pressure to regulate a lot of these issues that excess nitrogen application causes. So if you apply too much, not only are you losing money, but you're also causing a lot of pollution. So this is kind of a joke cartoon, but in all seriousness, um, if you think about different varieties are gonna respond to nitrogen and increase their yield, but this curve, um, there's a point at which you're gonna make money by adding fertilizer. There's a point at which you're gonna lose money by adding fertilizer. Um, this example I have here is that there's about 90 million acres of corn in the US, but in any given year, an economically optimal amount of nitrogen to apply for about 30% of those acres might be none. Um, and the cost average, let's say, this is a lowball estimate here, but this is, is a huge amount of, of savings and would also reduce production and application by quite a lot. Um, the challenge though is how to know how much to apply because both of those things, um, how much you apply and when it will be utilized, both depend on the hybrid. Um, some of the older terms that are used in this area of research are like racehorse and workhorse. I don't know if I love those terms. <laughs> They're a bit old, but the idea being that some varieties are going to respond really strongly and continue to put on yield, whereas other ones, it won't matter how much more you add. They're not going to get much better. Um, some varieties will utilize more of the nitrogen later in the season. So during this grain filling period, they might be taking up or utilizing more nitrogen. The challenge though, if you're a farmer, a new variety is only going to be sold for maybe two, three years max. It's not often that you're going to be able to buy the same variety over and over and over. They turn over, right? So how do you guess if you're going to plant a variety, how do you guess how much nitrogen you use? Um, so that's kind of where this project started out. Uh, we wanted to ask, what is it that changes physiologically under nitrogen stress and throughout development? What is different or unique about the hybrids that have high versus low response? Uh, can we define different nitrogen response types for different hybrids or is there just too much noise? How stable are those across environments? And then ultimately the goal is gonna be whether we can identify some genetic markers for nitrogen response. I don't know if that's possible or not, but it would be great. Here is some of the data coming out of this project. This is three years worth of data from 2020 to 2022 for 16 different hybrids. So it's a combination of four females and four males. And we do get relatively different uh, sorts of responses. 
and some of which are fairly stable, some of which are really not. There's you know, wide dramatic responses. So it does come from a combination of gene type, environment, and their interactions, of course. Um, but just to pull out for fun, I pulled out a subset of four of these. And this is, again, the three-year averages. So yield uh, response across these years. Uh, you can see the high is in blue. The low is in this reddish orange color. Um, but you can see that because this last figure was response, this is now showing you where the response comes from. Something that's a really high responder might be because it's yielding high in the high or low in the low or a combination of those things. So some have kind of overall high yield more often than not, whereas some have really high yield and combined with really low yield. But the interesting thing here for the geneticists in the room, this is just two females and two males in the, in the different combinations. So the fact that we're seeing all these different response types, I think is, is interesting given that the genetics here are a limited set of individuals. Uh, what we have seen is that in terms of uh, photosynthetically active leaf tissue, so the supplemental nitrogen will maintain that to different degrees and different hybrids. Um, we have observed hybrid variable changes in lots of different traits, as you would expect. I think as you would expect anyway. Um, but also in phenolic compound accumulation, as well as chlorophyll levels, carotenoids, plastoquinone, and phylloquinone, uh, plastoglobule size in abundance. This is a cellular ultrastructure sort of trait, cell wall thickness, and even plastoglobule shape, which is, I think, unexpected. And then we looked at gene expression as well. Given that this is a digital ag talk and not molecular biology, I'm going to send you to this publication of plant physiology because it just came out couple days ago, um, but it's a collaboration with Peter Lundquist and Eric Goldwell. So you can read all up about nitrogen response in this article. Um, but what our lab is interested in here is that we're looking at leaf spectral reflectance uh, to estimate health and nutrient status, including nitrogen, of course. I don't think I have to tell you guys, but leaves are reflecting and cleaning uh, this electromagnetic radiation based on the biochemical and physical properties. So if we look at the light that is, in this case, transmitting, uh, we can learn about what nutrient conditions and levels there are. So this is Brandon Webster, who I mentioned earlier, uh, some of his work. This is one of his very early, very early preliminary models looking at nitrogen predictions um, from some of this data. Uh, he also is able to, to um, effectively predict a number of other nutrients as well. So good, a good sign. This is working reasonably. And then eventually where we want to go is into the genetics of nitrogen response using broader panels. We had a panel of inbreds planted under nitrogen treatments. We had, we had hybrids for several years. We had um, inbreds last year. And this year we did actually a mixed panel where we have hybrids and their parents all kind of together. So this is an example imagery orthomosaic from last month, where we have high nitrogen hybrids, uh, low nitrogen hybrids, and then high and low nitrogen inbreds. I don't know what the lighting is like here, but if you look at it on the computer screen, you can visually see immediately the differences between those four categories. So one of the things Brandon is working on is looking at growth dynamics between treatments. This is a very simple example looking just at plant height. And what he sees is that after our side dress um, is applied here, then he can start differentiating between the treat treatments at about 27 days. Um, so they, they differentiate quite well. Plant height is one of the more, I would say, obvious, you know, easy traits. Um, and that's something that we knew would differ with nitrogen treatment. So we're really interested in other things as well. But this is a good starter to show that things are working. Which brings me into the more complicated questions beyond plant height, right? Yes. Um, does anybody know uh, how much nitrogen do plants get from the seed? I don't know. There's not a lot. Why do you ask? Because uh, what's the follow-up? Seeds are loaded with nitrogen, right? 
So I think you could directly find out how much is taken up and how much left in the plant. You mean the seed that's planted? Yes, seed that's planted. Well, I can tell you if you plant a seed and you don't give it any supplemental nitrogen, the plants will die when they're about this big. And the reason I can tell you that is because I just had a greenhouse experiment experience with a new student and that's what they did. Uh, they didn't get fertilized and they died. So <laughs> that's about how long that nitrogen will last. Uh, it's an unintentional experiment. <laughs> The miscommunication in a uh, fertilizer source. But it is an interesting question about maybe seed size. You would assume seed size is related to seed nitrogen, perhaps. Maybe it's not. But yeah, that's a good question. Is early season bigger. Mm. Okay, canopy architecture. So this gets into some of the big questions in the lab that we're wanting to push forward that I'll be looking for some collaborators on. Um, so we want to, as I mentioned, predict how a variety is going to perform in order to assess its usefulness. And as I mentioned, we could use genetics, but it doesn't work as well in new environments. One approach to this is to use a physiological modeling approach, for example, crop growth models, to simulate varieties in different environments. In order to do that, you would need to have parameters for the model. So if you wanted to do that on a genotype specific basis, you'd need to measure those genotypes, those parameters, <coughs> on lots of individuals. So our question was, could we acquire those phenotypes some other way? If we could sense somehow the parameters, then we can link all of this together, right? We can link to the genomic prediction, we can link to the crop growth models, we can predict unobserved <coughs> genetics into unobserved environments. That would be excellent. Um, the way I had thought about this, and I may have even made this slide many years ago, but I've been thinking about, okay, what sensor technologies are possible? What can they measure, perhaps? What can we model from that? And then what, if you were to put insert a crop growth model here to combine some of these things to actually get to your outputs that you can't get to directly from, say, genetics as readily. Um, so I had had some experience with several of these here at Purdue. And I had gotten my feet wet in Michigan doing a few of these as well. But the big kind of question mark for us was on the side of <clears throat> LIDAR. We had obtained a new colloid system with this LIDAR involved, and we had pretty good data. But the question is, all these little red lines that I made connect to LIDAR, is that really possible? Are those feasible? So what we did was we tested it. Um, I had the Wisconsin diversity panel growing out in the field. So this was 761 different varieties in two replications, an average of about 40 plants per plot. So this is a total of over 1,500 plots. And we, in each plot, labeled and then counted and measured a bunch of things. And the reason we were doing this is because, again, while I was at Purdue, we had made some of these models where we took leaf numbers and measured leaf area. And the blue dots are what we actually measured. And then the red line is the power model that was fit. And I've never seen data that fits this nicely. But this is from Sorghum. We applied it in maize. All that you need here is to know the total number of leaves, the largest leaf number, and the largest leaf area. And then you can create this whole curve. And so that's what we measured for maize uh, were those particular parameters. And then the question was, could we use this LIDAR data to estimate any of those characteristics? I had no idea what to expect. We had seven dates of LIDAR, but we were asking, can we even collect, process, and extract a data set? Because we'd never used this before. It was the first time, you know? You try. Um, can we generate some features from those play clouds that describe anything, preferably more than just height? So we were pretty sure we could get that. Uh, what's the best way to use those features to predict traits? How much do the predictions improve over the course of the growing season? So we have seven different dates. Um, are those comparable to human collected data? How does phenomenal prediction compare to genomic prediction? So all those questions. Here's the data that we had. This is the 1500 maize plots. Obviously this is shown as just heights above sea level. So this is all adjusted to ground level. 
Um, but that gives you a sense of the, the slope across our field. Yeah, spatial, spatial data is important. Uh, so this is, if you look at just one plot, there's seven scans across the grain season. And I needed to have a picture here. I think I forgot to include. This is a collaboration with Daniel Morris, um, who is excellent. And he's been a really, really good collaborator with us in this, this area. Um, but what, what he did here was created a voxel model of each of the plots. So you can think of pixels as being you know, 2D areas of data. These are just 3D areas of data, really 4D in the sense that it's over time. Um, but we had these two plots for genotype with our replication. He divided them in half, so we had four samples. And then we did some prediction. So he created a convolutional neural network, and uh, we were able to predict a lot of traits a lot better than I thought they would be. I realize this is a very complicated graph, but bear with me. Let's start uh, with plant type. So the first bar here is if you take the very first date when the plants are this big, and you ask, can I predict plant type? No, you can't. Uh, but as the season goes on, it gets better and better, right? Uh, the solid color is using only that date by itself, and then the shaded color is using information from the previous dates. So you're using information over time. For a trait like plant height, if you're measuring it kind of at a, a peak time point here, it doesn't really matter if you're using temporal data or not. But for something like flowering time, then it really matters. So you see how there's this big jump between the solid bars and the, the shaded bars. <laughs> so having the previous date of data really boost a lot uh, your accuracy. But the interesting thing was there were a lot more traits that we predicted a lot better than I thought we would. Uh, things like leaf number, yes, yeah, over it's close to point eight. That looks like really, really good. Um, so a lot of a lot of traits were better than I thought. And he then asked the question, what if we were to try an ablation where voxel size? Does the voxel size matter? Because he had actually, I think it was at 10 centimeters, but he tried it at multiple different um, sizes and it didn't really have as much of an impact as you'd think, which worried me at first until I realized the way that he had set up the voxels were that each voxel was actually a probability of a point in the point cloud being in that space. And so it contains more information than what you might think, you know, based on, it's not, it's not a binary uh, value. So thinking of this, a pixel isn't really the right metaphor. Andy, what are those bars above? Oh yeah, sorry. So the bars above in both of these are the ground truth correlations. So if we take the two replications and we correlate them with each other, then what's the, the highest possible accuracy we'd expect to get? So the black bars are the correlation to ground truth values, essentially creating a ceiling for us in terms of how, how relatable are these traits? <clears throat> because you're gonna have error when you measure stuff by hand. So that's gonna give you a sense of how, how good is that trait in the first place. Like largest leaf number is only, <laughs> only repeatable at about 0.4. So the fact that we're getting that accuracy means that's about as good as it's gonna get. We don't have to tune the model to be better. It means the data is just that variable. Yeah. Thank you, I didn't say that. Um, another way to look at that is you can correlate your ground values we correlate the ground with the predicted. And then we also had, because of the replications, we could correlate our predicted values with the prediction. So these are all the known predictions that didn't involve any genotypes whatsoever. And again, we do remarkably well for a lot of traits. Some traits are, our hand measurements are still better, uh, but for some traits, the uh, like largest leaf length, predicted traits are showing better correlation. Interestingly, it looks the same. If you look at heritability, it's the same idea. So just different ways of looking at the same question. But the repeatability is all quite high. So the other thing I was interested in doing is comparing the predictive ability of phenomics versus genomics. So we did a couple of different models of genomic prediction, a Bayes A and a Bayes Ridge regression. And those are in the, unfortunately, pink and green. And then our LIDAR uh, accuracies are in blue. So again, you can see there's times that they're pretty equal. There's times when genomics wins, but there is a plant height. You really can't beat LiDAR data, which is encouraging. Deer height as well. Okay, so to summarize that project, yes, we can collect the data. That's good. Uh, generating the features from the plant clouds did improve the prediction. 
And we were successful in measuring plant height. <laughs> so that's good. It was surprising a little bit that the voxel size didn't matter that much, and that the prediction accuracy at flowering time, which would be in theory in time for breeding decisions, was already pretty high. Um, and then really surprising to me, at least, was that things like leaf length, leaf numbers, and flowering, other than leaf width and stand count, which were poor, but we had a pretty high prediction accuracy for a lot of these, what I would consider as parameters. Um, and I was actually pretty surprised that it was more accurate than genomic prediction, even for things like flowering time, which was surprising. Can you remind us what the genetic population was again? The Wisconsin Diversity Panel. So it was a panel of about 750 inbred varieties. So it is an artificially very diverse population. If you were to repeat this on something like the genomes of field hybrids, or any hybrids really, or a breeding population, you'd have very different results potentially. And that would be the next thing I would love to look at. We're pitching this for funding right now, but this was the, the preliminary work. All right, I have no sense of what time it is or whether I'm over, but let's talk about, oh, okay, so we're good. Um, future work a little bit, I'll be quick. So one thing that uh, one of my students has been interested in is looking at temporal multispectral data to estimate yield. He was using the genomes to field spots and he had taken, he had extracted a trait I guess I don't have the slide on here that shows you the trait, and I apologize. But he had looked at essentially canopy greenness, NVDI, over time. So it's a nice little curve like this, right? And then it goes down. Um, and he'd taken, he'd extracted the data from flowering time up until the point at which the peak greenness starts to drop off. And he extracted that time point and then just literally directly correlated it with yield. So this isn't a model or anything, it's just a scatter plot of those values. And so he called this. Difference GDP, I don't, I don't like the thing, but that's, that's what he called it. Um, so he's just correlating it with yield. And he showed me data for 20, 2020 and 2021, I think initially, which were the same varieties, but very different um, weather seasons for us in Michigan. And I said, well, that's pretty impressive, but it's the same germplasm. Maybe you should try it with different varieties. So then he added 2019, which would have been a different set of germplasm, and it still worked pretty well. I said, well, okay, this is all just in Michigan using only our sensors with our data extraction methods, et cetera. So then we got some data from Wisconsin and added that to the mix. They had used a very different sensor and had done a very different processing method um, and had calculated everything differently. And it still worked pretty well. I think if you take out their zero plots, it would have worked even better. But so this is across five year locations. Um, and the excitement wouldn't really be in predicting any individual genotype here, but it would be in getting a year location estimate. Um, because right now your genetic prediction is gonna get, you know, genetics sorted out somewhat, but where you're gonna fall on that axis, I think is a is an important piece. So that's fun. This is new results that I haven't done a lot with yet. So keep working on writing some things up and, you know, testing a few different applications. Um, but for one of the things he's interested in <clears throat> is looking at uh, identifying candidate genes across different years and traits. And so because he has all this uh, phenotypic data and drone imagery data for the last 18, 19, 20, 20 four or five years, um, he's done some genetic mapping with all of that data and compared it to our hand measured traits. The way he calculates NDBI is the very traditional method where you're taking the whole plot area. So it includes ground pixels, but it's intentional because we're looking at things like yield where we want to take into account the stand. So things that have a low stand count are going to have a low NBDI mm -hmm. early in the season. So we acknowledge that we're not capturing biochemistry because that's not his goal. He's looking at agronomy, right? So this is NBDI from a couple of different dates, um, three different dates, and then stand count. And sure enough, he finds genes that are in common between his NBDI and his stand count. Great. Um, Another example is that he looked at NBDI and root logic. He found that the later dates in the season and years where there's lodging, that's what NBDI is also measuring, is how much has fallen over. So we do see some uh, shared genetic loci between those traits. So that's just a couple of random examples, uh, but I think he's doing some, some fun stuff. All right, questions before I move on? Yeah. On the first slide here, you're 
seems like you're picking up mainly year to year variation. <clears throat> Whereas you had the dip GDD on the horizontal axis. That's oh, yes. yes. You had like a line. Yes. To it. Yes. I just, I'm having a hard time sort of interpreting it with the years being so different, right? Like the, the colors cluster. So it seems like the line is more comparing years than the actual. <clears throat> yes. Dip GDD. Yes, I don't have any examples for within a year, but it does work somewhat. But yes, it is really capturing year to year differences um, as one of the major things. But we were arguing that that's not necessarily a bad thing because that's right now the one thing that your genomic prediction models can't get. You can't get an estimate. You, you get your estimate piece to the market, but you don't know what mean to use, right? It's so this, we can characterize sort of your locations. We're arguing that it has some value, but again, we're going to need to combine this with that other data in order to prove that that's actually the case. And he's working on that right now. So, yeah, I think there's there's potential, but we'll see what it is. Come back ahead. Other questions? Um, I wanted to mention briefly. Mitch actually already mentioned that I I well, I teach. Uh, the first year of the graduate plant breeding course, but then also this frontiers in computational plant science. And one of the things that I try to push, it's really project oriented and team-based, very interdisciplinary. We have students from a bunch of different majors, but the thing we're mainly teaching isn't necessarily the data science, it's the communication skills to get students to work together, work with other um, areas of expertise. This is something I found super helpful in my training at Purdue and something I wanted to help recreate. And I, somewhat jokingly, somewhat seriously, use this example from XKCD, um, where you have a person that wants to develop an app where when a user takes a photo, it checks whether they're in a park. She's like, okay, that's easy. GIS look up, we can tell when they're in a national park. And he says, and check whether the photo's over. She says, I'll need a research team in five years. Now this comic is at least five years old. So by now, I think there are apps that you can take a picture, it'll say that's a bird. But it did take some time. Uh, but the point is, it, in computer sciences, it can be hard to explain the difference between the easy and the virtually impossible. And that's part of what I want to kind of help students learn that when they're facing some sort of challenge, um, either on the computational or the plant science side, that when you learn to communicate and collaborate with other people, that's when you can kind of figure out and start thinking like, like a data scientist uh, in order to make those connections. So to give you a couple of examples, this is from, we, we usually have at least one phenomics model each uh, year. This is taught in the spring. So this is an example of one of our phenomics modules where we partnered with Syngenta and their sweet corn breeding program and they sent us pictures of ears. One of the traits they were interested in was what's called blank fill. So when you have spots where there's not kernels on the ear. And so the students set up an image uh, analysis pipeline where they had a threshold that detected kernels and a threshold that detected ears and was attracted to two. This seems super straightforward, but to students who had never done any image processing in their life, to you know do that in a matter of four weeks or so, um, do less than that. We usually do three modules a semester, so this is a third of a semester. And that's pretty good. Uh, the other example I like to show, so we actually um, drove down to Ohio to one of the Weaver Park cornfield trials. Brad's group and drove through one of their, their yield trials with a, uh, a little rover and collected LIDAR data. Uh, and then this was a disease trial in potato with Dave Douches. So we had drone imagery from his potato plots and the students were able to detect some difference between the disease and the undiseased varieties. Um, the reason I'm giving this example though is to show you what their initial pass looked like. So they came to me early on in the, in the project. They said, what's going on here? We can't see the corn. Where's the corn? It's supposed to be here. Does anyone see what's going on? So when the LIDAR, the, 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 the rover's driving along like this. When the LIDAR doesn't hit a plant piece and instead moves out of the canopy into infinity, it hits you know, the sky. But there's just the default value for infinity in the lighter. So these are all the infinite values. So once they filtered all those out, this is where all the canopy was. That's where all the point is. 
Okay, what about here? What if you saw, what if you saw this? Yeah, I made that face too. <laughs> Not this face right there. What do you think happened? <laughs> you don't have anything coming back. What you're doing is you're getting stuff off the platform. Yeah, it goes out, it goes out, and it doesn't come back, and you don't record. Well, this is it goes out and it doesn't come back. This we actually did get things back, but I said this is not a plant. None of these are plants. There's no way. And sure enough, this was where we discovered that we had that shift in in the file. I made the shape files based on the RGB data, and I was pulling information out of the hyperspectral data, and they were off diagonally by about a meter. <laughs> And so if you look at the shape file with the RGB and the hyperspectral, like I was pulling data out from you know over here somewhere. So in some cases it would shift the plot over, but in some cases it would shift out into the dirt. So that was a lesson for me. But we, we were pulling out dirt, and so I was able to just shift the whole shape file over, re-extract the data, and then sure enough, we had something that looked reasonable, although clearly there's still a lot of cleaning up that could be done. Better than that. But they learned. How to work with real life data and troubleshoot really complicated problems. Oh, uh, okay. I'm getting towards the end of this. Don't worry, it's been time. But I do have some opportunities for collaboration. One is that I do run that class that I just mentioned every single year. We're always looking for data sets, expertise. If you want to give like a little guest lecture, if you have a data set that's challenging you want the students to look at, doesn't even have to be phenomics because it's computational plant sciences. So we do a lot of bioinformatics, a lot of genotype phenotypes type work, um, you name it. But we're always looking for interesting things. Um, gene editing capability is something I don't have. So if you do and you're interested, we have some candidate genes we could test and validate, that'd be fun. Um, we, I do have a collaboration started, barely, on looking at automated quantification of foliar plant diseases. I am starting with maize. Kind of what's our thought, but the, the focus isn't necessarily on building the models. It's on kind of the front end and the back end. So if you have interesting disease detection models or are interested in like anything in that space, great. I wouldn't be stepping on your toes. Um, crop growth models, simplification and application at scale. We have everything up until that point, but we need help with that connection there. And we still have the issue with that geo-rectification of the hyperspectral data. So <laughs> any advice would be great. Okay, those are my opportunities. Uh, funding acknowledgements. I've kind of listed some of the people, but I don't have a, another person acknowledgement, unfortunately, which I should. Um, but thank you. If you have questions, we can talk. I have time. Email address, website. And then just for fun, for those of you who knew them, here is the update. So they still help out in the field, but they got bigger. <laughs> <laughs> All right, happy to take questions. I have a question about the uh, three levels of spectrum uh, data set we have collected. Um, we have powder based in the lead level and then the whole cup. Um, from this uh, progression, have you had a chance to identify any spectral feature that repeat itself from the very foundation level, from the, uh, the powder level to the canopy? Not yet, but I'm not sure how. I think between the, the leaf and the canopy, it might be possible. But as John has rightfully brought up, a lot of those signatures are going to be out in more interesting parts of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I mean, you could argue that maybe our FTMIR and our drone may be capturing some of the same things, maybe. We're not there yet, partly because we started this on seed and then pitched it in leaves. So we've got part of the data in seed and part of the data in leaves. And we haven't done the other pieces and the other tissues. So mm -hmm. we're, we're not all the way there yet. It's a current current project that's ongoing. Also just for my clarification, are you looking for the signature for the disease or for the chemical? For what? For disease or for specific chemical? Both. For both. Okay. We're trying it for both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it, so that is another collaboration with crop physiology and biochemistry. And so um, we would, sorry, crop, crop physiology. Oh. What am I trying to say? Disease. 
pathology. Pathology, thank you, that's the word. Okay, pathology and biochemistry. And so we're interested in both um, and relating the two ideally, but even if we don't see as much correlation as we previously saw with, between the phenolics and the tar spot, which we still think we will, but even if we don't, we can still build the models for each of those things separately. Yeah. So you basically ground the LE with disease. Yes, well, with and without disease, yeah. With and without, okay. Yeah. Ideally, parts of the same leaf or different similar leaves on different plants, mm -hmm. or, you know, so we have all those combinations, ground up bits of leaves. So, even though you only use cleaners, you said you have the spectrometer data, the data, and you have the UAV data. So even for the up through the the spectrometer is not the leaf clip; it's oh. the Jianjin's rolling scanner. Oh, oh. So it's not as wide of a range. Okay. Yeah. Trying to compare. Yeah, I saw where you're going. Sorry, <laughs> not the same. It's it's deceiving too because earlier I did have a, a picture of some people standing in sorghum with one of the can't help spectrometers, but. but but seriously, I was hoping at least maybe too naive. I was hoping even in the veneer band we could see something. Or even in the veneer band, the physical veneer band, that, that, so. that shows some kind of like, especially. Oh, it'll show band. a lot. Yeah, it'll yeah. it'll show disease. Yeah. You Whether we know. You can look at you know try to. Look at the red eggs and look at the, yeah. the, the oh, yeah. plateau and the IR. I was surprised to actually drop because what we mostly see is an increase because. You see an increase in like cellulose tissue. Interesting. Well, it might yeah. depend on what the disease is. This would have been like potato late blight, I think. Yeah. So I don't know. Mm. And one of the things that you know we've been trying to understand um, better is what we can get at <clears throat> the leaf level, and you know how well that relates to you know what because you're looking at sort of a totally different area, and potentially it might not even be the top leaf. Um, so how much, how they go in through the seeds and there are, you know, what kind of offsets there are and that sort of stuff. That's why I asked the question. Um, after my bounce spot now, so we noticed uh, over the last couple of years that the disease does not start on the plant after the leaf surgeon over the last few years or so. That's weather related. Any... That's coincidence. It's weather related. You can get young tissue to infect if it's in the right environment. Can you get young small tissue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, we can do it in the greenhouse, but it's we don't have a good inoculation protocol per se. We have a, a reasonable spreading protocol. So once we have some tar spot infected plants, we put them in the greenhouse, put them in a humid condition, and then put seedlings in there with it, it'll spread. So you can get tar spot on seedlings. You can, yeah, it, it can be kind of anywhere. I've seen like on husk leaves and everything, but it's really just weather dependent. And not many places up in here in the upper Midwest have moist conditions at that stage. It's really humid. So before last year, June 26th, first, I think it was the 7th. But we've seen it be fun as well. Yeah. I do one question about the automated fully disease detection. Uh, I know we didn't cover that. So yeah, I just teased it. I'm excited. Yeah. So <laughs> so one thing I was wondering is you mentioned uh, you're doing it for tar spot, right? So ish. I'm not I'm we're putting together the grant application now. <coughs> okay. We have pieces of this. We've done a little work in tar spot. These guys have done a lot more work in tar spot. We've done really rudimentary boots on the ground type work. So we've taken cell phone imagery of leaves and we've annotated images and we've started building kind of like machine learning models that can do classification as well as quantification. But what we're hoping to move into is the pieces before that and after that. So I have a collaborator that's really interested in building automated annotation pipelines and someone who's interested in implementing this like in the field book. So you could take your picture and then have it tell you like the field book trait, right? So that's the pieces I think that are really practical and applicable. But we are looking to make this all really open source and extensible and like have people plug stuff in. So if you develop a really cool uh, prediction model that says like I can detect whether this has this disease 
and at what rate or whatever incidence to severity. Um, hopefully, we can just like plug that in to that pipeline. That's that's the dream. Yeah, I'm more curious about the classification problem because you know most species they have a very difficult region shape. Yeah. So, so if you can subset those and uh, chase each one. And, you know, yeah, but that's a big. There'd be lots of people looking at lots of different diseases. Right, yeah. So my idea is if I get this pipeline in place and I can demonstrate it for one little thing, then I could say, hey, genomes to field collaboration. If you guys see a disease in your field, take some pictures of it, send them our way. We'll plug it in. Yeah. Have you ever considered maybe leveraging the fluorescence in those for tar spot detection? Nope. We don't have your capabilities here. <laughs> <laughs> um, fluorescence. No, I, short answer is no, but um, it's something we could think about. Right now, it's outside my scope of technology, at least in part. I know you do. I know. <laughs> I've been leveraging a lot of Purdue tech, you can tell. <laughs> is it a boilermaker? Frog? Yes. Because I saw one of those. He is a Spartan. He is a Spartan frog. Spartan. Okay. We have a competition each year in the nursery uh -huh. to take pictures and count the number of frogs you can find. Because they love our fields and they hide right down where the shoots come out. Yeah. So if you're doing a good job looking for shoots to shoot bag, you find more frogs. <coughs> Last year, the winner found like 85 frogs. This, this, this summer, six. So again, very year dependent. <laughs> How much we see of the well, same as your girls to stop that. <laughs> Probably not. Kind of We're cute though. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks everybody for your thanks, time and yeah. attention. Thanks.